before Prabhupada actually boarded the Java Dutta uh, for his historic voyage to America. And I was thinking, um, I was going to, my original plan was to make it a little interactive by asking all of us to read one page and in that way pass the little merit around. But there are some technical problems with that um, in the sense of the audio is not so good with the other microphone going uh, devotee to devotee and also these lectures are being recorded. And many of us, many of us do uh, relish when we can't make it here to the temple watching the morning classes. So for that reason, I will read myself. Um, and uh, of course we don't have so many devotees here either, so uh, this morning. So we're going to be reading from chapter 11 of this first volume. And this chapter is entitled, The Dream Come True. So we'll read... Uh, yeah, just the last 14 pages of I'd like to read the whole chapter because it's very interesting. There's so much history. It's uh, really hard melting and hard rendering. Um, but this volume will go back into the bookcase immediately this morning. And if any of you have a chance today um, to read a little more, I'm sure it would be a very wonderful spiritual investment of your time. But, uh, and then we have, we've made a few notes which we'll try and add at the end and open it up for some questions or comments. Uh, yeah, we go on this very historic occasion. First of all, I'll just read uh, a quote from Srila Prabhupada at the beginning of this chapter, A Dream Come True. Uh, I, plan, I planned that I must go to America. Generally, they go to London. But I did not want to go to London. I was simply thinking how to go to New York. I was scheming whether I shall go this way, through Tokyo, Japan, or that way. Which way is cheaper? That was my proposal. And I was targeting to New York always. Sometimes I was dreaming that I had come to New York. <laughs> So we'll just go ahead here, everyone, and start here. This is actually a little ahead. Uh, this is in March of 1964. Uh, Krishna Pandit, Bhakti Swami's sponsor at the Radha Krishna Temple in Chippewa, arranged for him to reside for a few months at the Radha Balavaji Temple in the nearby Rosanpura Naishari neighborhood. There he could continue his writing and publishing, but he would also be giving a series of lectures. Krishna Pandit provided Bhaktivedanta Swami about 1,500 rupees for his maintenance. On Bhaktivedanta Swami's arrival at Sri Radha Balavaji Temple, the manager described the manager distributed notices inviting people to take full advantage of the presence of a Vaishnava sadhu. As resident Acharya, Bhaktivedanta Swami held morning and evening discourses at the temple without reducing his activities of writing and printing. In June, Bhaktivedanta Swami got the opportunity to meet Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri. The meeting had been arranged by Dolodram Khanna, a wealthy jeweller who was a trustee of the Chippewada temple and had often met with Bhaktivedanta Swami there. An old friend of Prime Minister Shastri's since his youth, when they attended the same yoga club, Mr. Khanna arranged the meeting as a favour to Bhaktivedanta Swami. Let the Prime Minister meet a genuine sadhu, Mr. Khanna thought. It was a formal occasion in the gardens of the Parliament building, and the Prime Minister was meeting a number of guests. Prime Minister Shastri dressed in white kurta and dhoti with a Nehru hat and surrounded by maids, received the elderly sadhu. Bhaktivedanta Swami, looking scholarly in his spectacles, stepped forward and introduced himself and his book, Srimad Bhagavatam. As he handed the Prime Minister a copy of Volume 1, 
A photographer snapped a photo of the author and the Prime Minister smiling over the book. I guess that's a wonderful photo that's included in this volume. The next day, Bhaktivinoda Swami wrote to Prime Minister Shastri. He soon received a reply, personally signed by the Prime Minister. Quote, Dear Swamiji, many thanks for your letter. I am indeed grateful to you for presenting a copy of Srimad Bhagavatam to me. I do realise that you are doing valuable work. It would be a good idea for the libraries in the government institutions to purchase copies of this book. Bhaktivedanta Swami wrote back to the Prime Minister requesting him to buy books for Indian institutions. Mr. R. K. Sharma of the Ministry of Education subsequently wrote back confirming that they would take 50 copies of Volume 2 just as they had taken Volume 1. To concentrate on completing Volume 3, Bhaktivedanta Swami returned to the Radha Temple. These were the last chapters of the first canto, dealing with the advent of the present age of Kali. There were many verses foretelling society's degradation and narrating how the great King Pariksit had staved off Kali's influence by his strong Krishna conscious rule. In his purports, Bhaktivedanta Swami wrote that government could not check corruption unless it rooted out the four basic principles of irreligion, NTT, illicit sex, intoxication, and gambling. You cannot check all these evils of society simply by statutory acts of police vigilance, but you have to cure the disease of mind by the proper medicine, namely advocating the principles of Brahminical culture or the principles of austerity, cleanliness, mercy, and truthfulness. We must always remember that false pride, undue attachment for women or association with them, and intoxicating habit of all description will cripple the human civilization from the path of factual peace. However, the people may go on clamoring for such peace of the world. End of quote. I shall to raise funds for Volume 3, Bhaktivedanta Swami decided to try Bombay. He travelled there in July and stayed at the Prem Kutia Dhamshala, a free ashram, Srila Prabhupada. At Prem Kutia, they received me very nicely. I was going to sell my books. Some of them were criticising. What kind of sannyasi? He is making business book selling. Not the authorities said this, but some of them. I was writing my book then also. Then I became a guest for 15 days with a member of the Dalmia family. One of the brothers told me that he wanted to construct a little cottage at his house. You can live there. I will give you a nice cottage. I thought, no, it is not good to be fully dependent and patronised by a Vishayi materialist. But I stayed for 15 days and he gave me exclusive use of a typewriter for writing my books. Bhaktivedanta Swami made his rounds of the institutions and booksellers in Bombay. He now had an advertisement showing himself with Prime Minister Shastri and he also had the Prime Minister's letter and the Ministry of Education's purchase order for 50 volumes. Still, he was only getting small orders. Then he decided to visit Sumati Maraji, head of the Skindia Steamship Company. He had heard from his godbrothers in Bombay that she was known for helping Southerners and had donated to the Bombay Gaudiya Mutt. He had never met her, but he, well, but he well remembered the 1958 promise by one of by one of her officers to arrange half fare passage for him to America. Now he wanted her help for printing Srimad Bhagavatam. But his first attempts to arrange a meeting were unsuccessful. Frustrated at being put off by Mrs. Maraji's officers, he sat down on the front steps of her office building, determined to catch her attention as she left for the day. The lone sadhu certainly caused some attention as he sat quietly chanting for five hours 
on the steps of the Skindia Steamship Company building. Finally, late that afternoon, Mrs. Maraji emerged in a flurry of business talk with her secretary, Mr. Chokshi. Upon seeing Bhaktivedanta Swami, she stopped. Who is this gentleman sitting here? She asked Mr. Chokshi. He's been here for five hours, the secretary said. All right, I'll come. She said, she said, and walked up to where Bhaktivedanta Swami was sitting. He smiled and stood, offering namaskars and his, with his folded palms. Swamiji, what can I do for you? She said. Bhaktivedanta Swami told her briefly of his intentions to print the third volume of his Srimad Bhagavatam. I want you to help me, he said. All right, Mrs. Maraji replied. You can, we can meet tomorrow because it is getting late. Tomorrow you can come and we will discuss. The next day, Bhaktivedanta Swami met with Mrs. Maraji in her office, where she looked at the type manuscript and the published volumes. All right, she said, if you want to print it, I will give you the A. Whatever you want, you can get it printed. With Mrs. Maraji's guarantee, Bhaktivedanta Swami was free to return to Vrindavan to finish writing the manuscript. As with the previous volumes, he set a demanding schedule for writing and publishing. The third volume would complete the first canto. Then, with a supply of impressive literature, he would be ready to go to the West. Even with volumes one and two, he was getting a better reception in India. Already, he had seen the Vice President and the Prime Minister. He had successfully approached a big business magnate in Bombay, and within a few minutes of presenting the book, he had received a large donation. The books were powerful preaching. Jamastami was drawing near, and Bhaktivedanta Swami was planning a celebration at the Radha Damodar Temple. He wanted to invite Vishwanath Das, the governor of Uttar Pradesh, to preside over the ceremony honouring Lord Krishna's appearance. Sri Vishwanath had received a copy of Srimad Bhagavatam Volume 1 and had written a favourable review. Although a politician, he was known for his affection and respect for sadhus. He regularly invited recognised sadhus to his home and once a year he would visit all the important temples of Mathura and Vrindavan. Bhaktivinanta Swami asked Vrindavan's municipal Vrindavan's uh, municipal president, Mangalal Sharma, to invite the governor to the Janmastani celebration at Radha temple. The governor readily accepted the invitation. Bhaktivedanta Swami printed a flyer announcing, on the occasion of Janmastani cer ceremony at the Samadhi ground of Srila Rupa and Jiva Goswami, Sri Sri Radha Damada temple, Seva Kunj Vrindavan. Gaudiya Kirtan performances in the presence of His Excellency Sri Vishwanath Das, Governor of Uttar Pradesh. The Chief Guest, Sri G. D. Somani of Bombay, Trustee of Sri Ranganath Ji Temple, Vrindavan, dated at Vrindavan, Sunday, the 31st of August 1964, at 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. The fly contained an advertisement for Shumai Bhagavatam series to be completed in 60 volumes. Bhajans to be sung on the occasion would be Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu, Nitai Parakamala, the prayers to the six Goswamis, and other favourite songs of the Lord Vaishnavas, and were printed in Bengali as a songbook. The program was successful. A large crowd attended and sang songs to Lord Krishna and to Prashama. Bhaktivedanta Swami lectured on a verse from Srimad Bhagavatam describing the age of Kali as an ocean of faults that had but one saving quality in chanting Hare Krishna. After leading Hare Krishna Kirtan, Bhaktivedanta Swami presented a copy of his second volume of Srimad Bhagavatam to the governor and spoke of his plans to preach all over the world. The day after Janmastami was Bhaktivedanta Swami's 69th birthday. 
A few days later, Vishwanath Das requested Swami Maharaj to visit him at his mansion in Lucknow. It was a special occasion and the governor had invited several sadhus and planned a kirtan program. He had invited a professional mus musical group who toured India performing kirtan and giving recitals. One of the musicians, young Shishir Kumar Bhattacharya, was very impressed with Bhaktivedanta Swami. Quote, Shishir Bhattacharya. We were invited to perform kirtan in the governor's house in Lucknow. We had about seven or eight in our group. This was the governor's house, a big home, and I was sitting on a dais. I saw the governor, Vishwanath Das, and beside him was a sadhu who was old, but I thought was really strong. When I saw the governor sitting there, I came down from the dais and bowed down. Then I asked which subject he wanted to listen to. He said, let's have something about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Then I said, I'm very glad you selected this. About one half hour we spent on Mahaprabhu's kirtan, and then we had our dinner in the big banquet hall on all silver plates with the governor's symbols on each of them. We sat together and I was sitting side by side with the same sadhu, and he introduced himself as Bhaktivedanta Swami. We discussed, and then the Swami presented me with a book, Srimad Bhagavatam. But Ibnanta Swami said, I am interested to propagate Krishna Nam and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the Western countries. I am trying to get some way to find some ticket. If I get, I will go and I will propagate Mahaprabhu's teachings. And he uttered this verse from Mahaprabhu. Dipite ate jaso nagarajivam sapachat koibi moradam. But I did not think he would actually be able to do it because he was very simple and poor. And of course, we know the translation that the famous verse is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu speaking and predicting, one day my name will be known in every town and village of the world. When the manuscript for volume three, with, with the manuscript for volume three complete and with the money to print it, Bhaktivedanta Swami once again entered the printing world, purchasing paper, correcting proofs, and keeping the printer on schedule so that the book would be finished by January 1965. Thus, by his persistence, he who had almost no money of his own managed to publish his third large hardbound volume within a little more than two years. At this rate, with his respect in the scholarly world increasing, he might soon become a recognized figure amongst his countrymen. But he had his vision set on the West, and with the third volume now printed, he felt he was at last prepared. He was 69 and would have to go soon. It had been more than 40 years since Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had asked, had first asked a young householder in Calcutta to preach Krishna consciousness in the West. At first, it had seemed impossible to Abhay Charan, who had so recently entered family responsibilities. That obstacle, however, had long ago been removed, and for more than 10 years, he had been free to travel. But he had been penniless, and still was. And he had wanted first to publish some volumes of Srimad Bhagavatam to take with him. It had seemed necessary if he were to do something solid. Now, by Krishna's grace, three volumes were on hand. Srila Prabhupada. I plan that I must go to America. Same quote as we read at the beginning, but I'll read it again. It's significant. Generally, they go to London, but I did not want to go to London. I was simply thinking how to go to New York. I was scheming whether I shall go this way, to Tokyo, Japan, or that way. Which way is cheaper? That was my proposal, and I was targeting to New York always. Sometimes I was dreaming that I was in New York. Then Bhaktivedanta Swami met Mr. Agarwal, a Guru businessman, and mentioned to him in passing, as he did to almost everyone he met, that he wanted to go to the West. Although Mr. Agarwal had known Bhaktivedanta Swami for only a few minutes, he volunteered to try to get him a sponsor in America. 
It was something Mr. Agarwal had done a number of times when he met a sadhu who mentioned something about going abroad to teach Hindu culture. He would ask his son Gopal, an engineer in Pennsylvania, to send back a sponsorship form. When Mr. Agarwal volunteered to help his way, Bhaktivedanta Swami urged him please to do so. Sula Prabhupada, I did not say anything seriously to Mr. Agarwal, but perhaps he took it very seriously. I asked him, well, why don't you ask your son Gopal to sponsor so that I can go there? I want to preach there. But Bhaktivedanta Swami knew he could not simply dream of going to the West. He needed money. In March 1965, he made another visit to Bombay, attempting to sell his books. Again, he stayed at the free Dharmshala, Prem Kutia. But finding customers was difficult. He met Premananda Bhagwani, a librarian at Jai Hind College, who purchased books for the college library and then escorted Bhaktivedanta Swami to a few likely outlets. Mr. Bhagwani. I took, I took him to the popular book depot at Ram Road to help him in selling books. But they told us they couldn't stop the books because they don't have much sales on religion. Then we went to another shop nearby and the owner also regretted his inability to sell the books. Then he went to Sadhu Vela near Mahalakshmi Temple and we met the head of the temple there. He of course welcomed us. They have a library of their own and they, and they stock religious books. So we approached them to please keep a set there in their library. They are a wealthy ashram and yet he also expressed his nobility. Bhaktivedanta Swami returned to Delhi pursuing the usual avenues of book selling and looking for whatever opportunity might arise. And to his surprise, he was contacted by the Ministry of External Affairs and informed that his no objection certificate for going to the US was ready. Since he had not instigated any proceedings for leaving the country, Bhaktivedanta Swami had to inquire from the Ministry about what had happened. They showed him the statutory declaration form signed by Mr. Gopal Agarwal of Butler, Pennsylvania. Mr. Agarwal, solemnly declared that he would bear the experiences of Bhaktivedanta Swami during his stay in the US. Srila Prabhupada, whatever the correspondence was there between father and son, I do not know. I simply asked him, why don't you ask your son Gopal to sponsor? And now, after three or four months, the no objection certificate was sent from the Indian consulate in New York to me. He had already sponsored my arrival there for one month, and all of a sudden I got the paper. At his father's request, Gopal Agarwal had done as he had done for several other sons, none of whom had ever gone to America. It was just a formality, something to satisfy his father. Gopal had requested a form from the Indian consulate in New York, obtained a statement from his employer certifying his monthly salary, got a letter from his bank showing his balance as of April 1965, and had the form notarized. It had been stamped and approved in New York and sent to Delhi. Now Bhaktivedanta Swami had a sponsor, but he still needed a passport, visa, P form, and travel fare. The passport was not very difficult to obtain. Krishna Pandit helped, and by June 10th he had his passport. Certainly, he penned in his address at the Radha Krishna Temple in Chippewa and wrote his father's name, Gaur Mahandei. He asked Krishna Pandit also to pay for his going abroad, but Krishna Pandit refused, thinking it against Hindu principles for a sadhu to go abroad and also very expensive. Starting to get pretty, uh, getting a bit emotional here. 
because uh, Prabhupada's, yes, gradually getting everything uh, needed, everything necessary. Um, but we'll try and push on. If I get, if it gets a bit too much, it'd be for I'd have to ask you or to, to read for a while. I don't know if you're much better than me at keeping these emotions intact. But uh, it is a very special day, and uh, let me just take a little break here. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Excuse me. I was thinking very. Significant that uh, yesterday was Balaram's appearance day, um, just as in a week will be Krishna's appearance day, um, for six days. And then immediately after Janmasthami, as we all know, it's uh, Prabhupada's appearance day by divine arrangement. Um, and at least this year, this, these auspicious appearance days are worked out astrologically. But at least this year, yesterday, Balaram's appearance day, and today, this yeah, momentous occasion honouring this uh, yeah, wonderful Prabhupada's departure for the West, which we're eternally grateful for. With his passport and sponsorship papers, Bhaktivedanta Swami went to Bombay not to sell books or raise funds for printing. He wanted a ticket for America. Again, he tried approaching Sumati Maharaji. He showed his sponsorship papers to her secretary, Mr. Chokshi, who was impressed and who went to Mrs. Maraji on his behalf. The Swami from Vrindavan is back, he told her. He has published his book on your donation. He has a sponsor and he wants to go to America. He wants you to send him on a Skindia ship. Mrs. Maraji said no, and Swamiji was too old that Mrs. Maraji said no, the Swami was too old to go to the United States and expect to accomplish anything. As Mr. Chokshi conveyed to him Mrs. Maraji's words, Bhaktivedanta Swami listened disapprovingly. She wanted him to stay in India and complete Srimad Bhagavatam. Why go to the States? Finish the job here. But Bhaktivedanta Swami was fixed on going. He told Mr. Chokshi that he should convince Mrs. Maraji. He coached Mr. Chokshi on what he should say. I find this gentleman very inspired to go to the States and preach something to the people there. But when he told Mrs. Maraji, she again said no. The, sw the Swami was not healthy. It would be too cold there. He might not be able to come back. And she doubted whether he would be able to accomplish much there. People in America were not so cooperative and they would probably not listen to him. As ex exasperated with Mr. Chokshi's ineffectiveness, Bhaktivedanta Swami demanded a personal interview. It was granted, and a grey haired, determined Bhaktivedanta Swami presented his emphatic request Please give me one ticket. Sumati so Maharaji was concerned. Swamiji, you are so old, and you were taking this responsibility. Do you think it is all right? No, he reassured her, lifting his hand as if to reassure a doubting daughter, it is all right. But you do not know what my secretaries think. They say Swamiji is going to die there. Bhaktivedanta made a face as if to dismiss a foolish rumour. Again, he insisted that she give him a ticket. All right, she said, get your P form and I will make an arrangement to send you by our ship. Bhaktivedanta Swami smiled brilliantly and happily left her offices, past her amazed and sceptical clerks. <coughs> a P form, another necessity for an Indian national who wants to leave the country is a certificate given by the State Bank of India, certifying that the person has no excessive debts in India and is cleared by the banks. That would take a little while to obtain, and he also did not yet have a US visa. He needed to pursue, to pursue these government permissions in Bombay, but he had no place to stay. So Mrs. Maraji agreed to let him reside at the Skindia Colony compound of apartments for employees of the Skindia Company. He stayed in a small unfurnished apartment 
with only his trunk and typewriter. The resident's India employees all knew that Mrs. Maraji was sending him to the West, and some of them became interested in his cause. They were impressed, for although he was so old, he was going forward to preach. He was a special subject, a scholar. They heard from him how he was taking hundreds of copies of his books with him, but no money. He became a celebrity at the Skindia colony. Various families brought him rice, sabji, and fruit. They brought so much that he could not eat it all, and he mentioned this to Mr. Chokshi. Just accept it and distribute it, Mr. Chokshi advised. Bhaktivedanta Swami then began giving remnants of his food to the children. Some of the older residents gathered to hear him as he read and spoke from Srimad Bhagavatam. Mr. Vashavada, the chief cashier of Skindia, was particularly impressed and came regularly to, to learn from the Sadhu. Mr. Vashavada obtained copies of Bhaktivedanta Swami's books and read them in his home. Bhaktivedanta Swami's apartment shared a roofed-in veranda with Mr. Nagaraja, a Skindia office worker and his wife, Mrs. Nagaraja. Every time when I passed that way, he used to be writing or chanting. I would ask him, Swamiji, what are you writing? He used to sit near the window and one after another was translating the Sanskrit. He gave me two books and said, child, if you read this book, you will understand. He would have discourses in the house and four or five Gujarati ladies used to come. At one of these discourses, he told me, at one of these discourses in the house, at one of these discourses, he told one lady that those who wear their hair parted on the side, that is not a good idea. Every Indian lady should have her hair parted in the centre. They were very fond of listening and were very keen to hear his discourse. Every day he would go on trying to get his visa and P form as quickly as possible, selling his books and seeking contacts and supporters for his future Srimad Bhagavatam publishing. Mr. Ra Mr. Nagarajan tried to help. Using the telephone directory, he made a list of wealthy businesses and professional men who were Vaishnavas and might be inclined to assist. But Divinata Swami's neighbours at Skindia Colony observed him coming home dead tired in the evening. He would sit quietly, perhaps feeling morose. Some neighbours thought, uh, some neighbours thought, but after a while he would sit up, rejuvenated, and start writing. Mrs. Nagarajan, when he came home, we used to give him courage and we used to tell him, Swamiji, one day you will achieve your target. He would say, Time is still not right. Time is still not right. They are all Agyanis. They don't understand, but still I must carry on. Sometimes I would go by and his chatter would be on the chair, but he would be sitting on the windowsill. I would ask him, Swamiji, did you have any good contacts? He would say, not much today. I didn't get much. And it is depressing. Tomorrow Krishna will give me more details, and he would sit there quietly. After ten minutes, he would sit in his chair and start writing. I would wonder how Swamiji was so tired in one minute, and in another minute, even if he was tired, he was not defeated. He would never speak discouragement, and we would always encourage him and say, if today you don't get it, tomorrow you will definitely meet some people, and they will encourage you. And my friends used to come in the morning and in the evening for discourse and they would give namaskar and fruits. Mr. Nagarajan, his temperament was very adjustable and homely. Our friends would offer a few rupees. He would say, all right, it will help. He used to walk from our colony to Anhira station. It is two kilometers and he used to go there without taking a bus because he had no money. Bhaktivedanta Swami had a page printed entitled My Mission and he would show it to influential men in his attempts to get further financing for Srimad Bhagavatam. The printed statement proposed that God consciousness was the only remedy for the evils of modern materialistic society. 
Despite scientific advancement and material comforts, there was no peace in the world. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita and Shumai Bhagavatam, the glory of India must be spread all over the world. Mrs. Maraji asked Bhaktivedanta Swami if he would read Shumai Bhagavatam to her in the evening. He agreed. She began sending her car for him at six o'clock every evening. And they would sit in her garden where he would recite and comment on the Bhagavatam. Mrs. Maraji. He used to come in the evening and sing the verses in rhythmic tunes, as is usually done with the Bhagavatam. At certain points, when you sit and discuss, you raise so many points. He was commenting on certain points, but it was all from the Bhagavatam. So he used to sit and explain to me and then go. He could give time and I could hear him. That was for about 10 or 15 days. His backing at Skindia and his sponsorship to the US were a strong presentation. And with the help of the people at Skindia, he obtained his visa on July 28, 1965. But the P form proceeding went slowly and even threatened to be a last insurmountable obstacle. Sure, Prabhupada. Formerly, there was no restriction for going outside, but for a sannyasi like me, I had so much difficulty obtaining the government permission to go out. I had applied for the P-form sanction, but no sanction was coming. Then I went to the State Bank of India. The officer was Mr. Mantachari. He told me, Swamiji, you are sponsored by a private man, so we cannot accept. If you were invited by some institution, then we could consider. But you were invited by a private man for one month. And after one month, if you are in difficulty, difficulty, there will be so many obstacles. But I had already prepared everything to go. So I said, what have you done? He said, I have decided not to sanction your plea for... I said, no, no, don't do this. You better send me to your superior. It should not be like that, like that. So he took my request and he sent the file to the chief official of foreign exchange, something like that. So he was the supreme man in the state bank of India. So I went to see him, I asked his secretary, do you have such and such a file? You kindly put it to Mr. Roy, I want to see him. So the secretary agreed and he put the file and he put my name down to see him. I was waiting, so Mr. Roy came personally. He said, Swamiji, I passed your case, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry everyone, Hare Krishna. Oh, the emotional. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the real. That's the real tear joke of that one there, the P form. Uh, yes, but uh, he said, Swamiji, I passed your case, don't worry. Following Mrs. Maraji, oh, how many pages have we got to go? Oh, we're getting yeah, just a few more pages, everyone. I might be able to do it. Let's see. Following Mrs. Maraji's instruction, the secretary. Mr. Chokshi made final arrangements for Bhaktivedanta Swami. He had no warm clothes. Mr. Chokshi took him to buy a wool jacket and other woolen clothes. Mr. Chokshi spent about 250 rupees on new clothes, including some new dotis. At Bhaktivedanta Swami's request, Mr. Chokshi printed 500 copies of a small pamphlet containing the eight verses written by Lord Chaitanya and an, and an advertisement for Srimad Bhagavatam in the context of an advertisement for the Skindia Steamship Company. Mr. Choksi, I asked him, why couldn't you go earlier? Why do you want to go to the States now at this age? He replied that I will be able to do something good, I am sure. His idea was that someone should be there who would be able to go near people who were lost in life and teach them and tell them what the correct thing is. I asked him so many times, but why do you want to go to the States? Why don't you start something in Bombay or Delhi or Vrindavan? I was teasing him also. You are interested in seeing the States, therefore you want to go. All Swami want to go to the States 
and you want to enjoy that, he said, what, I, what have I got to see? I have finished my life. I have finished my life. But sometimes he was hot-tempered. He used to get angry at me for the delays. What is this nonsense, he would say. Then I would understand he is getting angry now. Sometimes he would say, oh, Mrs. Maraji has still not signed this paper. She says, come back tomorrow. We will talk tomorrow. What is this? Why this delay? Going, going back and forth. He would get angry. And I would say, you sit here. But he would say, how long do I have to sit? He would become impatient. Finally, Mrs. Maraji scheduled a place for him on one of her ships, the Jaladuta, which was sailing from Calcutta on August the 13th. He had, she had made certain that he would travel on a ship whose captain understood the needs of a vegetarian and a Brahmana. Mrs. Maraji told the Jaladuta's captain, Arun Pandya, to carry extra vegetables and fruits for the Swami. Mr. Chopsi spent the last two days with Bhaktivedanta Swami in Bombay, picking up the pamphlets at the press, purchasing clothes, and driving him to the station to catch the train for Calcutta. He arrived in Calcutta only a few days before the Jaladuta's departure. Although he had lived much of his life in the city, he now had nowhere to stay. It was as he had written in his Vrindavan Bhajana, quote, I have my wife, sons, daughters, grandsons, everything, but I have no money, so they are a fruitless glory, Unquote. Although in this city he had been so carefully nurtured as a child, whose early days, those early days, those early days were also gone forever. Quote, where have my loving father and mother gone to now? And where are all my elders who were my own folk? Who will give me news of them? Tell me who. All that is left of this family life is a list of names. Out of the hundreds of people in Calcutta whom Bhaktivedanta Swami knew, he chose to call on Mr. Sishir Bhattacharya, the flamboyant kirtan singer he had met a year before at the governor's house in Lucknow. Mr. Bhattacharya was not a relative, not a disciple, not even a close friend, but he was willing to help. Bhaktivedanta Swami quartered his place and informed him that he would be leaving on a cargo ship in a few days. He needed a place to stay and he would like to give some lectures. Mr. Bhattacharya immediately began to arrange a few private meetings at friends' homes where he would sing and Bhaktivedanta Swami would then speak. Mr. Bhattacharya thought the son who's leaving for America should make an important news story. He accompanied Bhaktivedanta Swami to all the newspapers in Calcutta, the Hindustan Standard, the Amrita Bazaar Patrika, the Jugantas, the Statesman, and others. Bhaktivedanta Swami had only one photograph, a passport photo, and they made a few copies for the newspapers. Mr. Bhattacharya would try to explain what the Swami was going to do, and the news writers would listen, but none of them wrote anything. Finally, they visited the Dainik Bashumati, a local Bengali daily, which agreed to print a small article in Bhaktivedanta Swami's picture. Mr. Bhattacharya continued to assist Bhaktivedanta Swami with his final business and speaking engagements. Mr. Bhattacharya, we just took a hired taxi to this place and that place, and he would go for preaching. I never talked to him during the preaching, but once when I was coming back from the preaching, I said, you said this and that about this, but I would tell you it is not this, it is this. I crossed him in something or argued, and he was furious. Whatever he argued, and I said, no, I think this is this, then he was shouting. He was very furious. He said, you are always saying, I think, I think, I think. What is the importance of what you think? Everything is what you think, but it doesn't matter. It matters what Shastra says. You must follow. I said, I must do what I think, what I feel. That is important. He said, no, you should forget this. You should forget your desire. You should change your habit. 
Better you depend on Shastras. You follow what Shastra wants and you do it. Uh, I am not telling you what I think, but I am repeating what the Shastra says. The day before his departure, Bhaktivedanta Swami travelled to nearby Mayapur to visit the Samadhi of Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Then he returned to Calcutta. He was ready. He had only a suitcase, an umbrella, and a supply of dry cereal. He did not know what he would find to eat in America. Perhaps there would be only meat. If so, he was prepared to live on boiled potatoes and cereal. His main baggage at several trunks of his books was being handled separately by Skinny Cargo. Two hundred three-volume sets. The very thought of the books gave him confidence. When the day came for him to leave, he needed that confidence. He was making a momentous break from his from his previous life, and he was dangerously old and not in strong health, and he was going to an unknown and probably unwelcoming country. To be poor and unknown in India was one thing. Even in, even in these Kali Yuga days, when India's leaders were rejecting Vedic culture and imitating the West, it was still India. It was still the remnants, the remains of Vedic civilization. He had been able to see millionaires, governors, the prime minister, simply by showing up at their doors and waiting. The sannyasi was respected, and Shuman Bhagavatam was respected. But in America, it would be different. He would be no one, a foreigner, and there was no tradition of sadhus, no temples, no free ashrams. And when he thought of the books he was bringing, transcendental knowledge in English, he became confident. When he met someone in America, he would give them a flyer. Srimad Bhagavatam, India's message of peace and goodwill. It was August the 30th, just a few days before Janmasthami, the appearance day anniversary of Lord Krishna. The next day would be his own 70th birthday. During these last years, he had been in Vrindavan for Janmasthami. Many Vrindavan residents would never leave there. They were all at peace in Vrindavan. Bhaktivedanta Swami was also concerned that he might die away from Vrindavan. That was why all the Vaishnava, sadhus and widows had taken vows not to leave, even for Matura, because to die in Vrindavan was the perfection of life. And the Hindu tradition was that a sannyasi should not cross the ocean and go to the land of the lynches. But beyond all that was the desire of Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and his desire was not different from that of Lord Krishna. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had predicted that the chanting of Hare Krishna would be known in every town and village of the world. Mr. Bhattacharya and Bhaktivedanta Swami took a taxi down to the Calcutta port. Bhaktivedanta Swami was carrying a Bengali copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which he intended to read during the crossing. Somehow he would be able to cook on board, or if not, he could starve, whatever Krishna desired. He checked his, his, his essentials, Passenger ticket, passport, visa, paid for, sponsor's address. Finally, it was happening. Shri Prabhupada, with what great difficulty I got out of the country. Some way or other, by Krishna's grace, I got out. So I could spread the Krishna consciousness movement all over the world. Otherwise, to remain in India, it was not possible. I wanted to start a movement in India, in India but I was not at all encouraged. The black cargo ship, small and weathered, was moored at dockside. A gangway leading from the dock to the ship's deck. Indian merchant sailors curiously eyed the elderly saffron dress so as he spoke last words to his companion in the taxi and left and walked determinedly towards the boat. For thousands of years, Krishna Bhakti had been known only in India, not outside, except in twisted, faithless reports by foreigners. And the only Swabis to have reached America had been non-devotee, Mayavadi impersonalists. But now Krishna was sending Bhaktivedanta Swami in his, as his emissary. Mr. Bhattacharya, he was alone, a lone fighter when he left. There was no one on the shore to bid him goodbye. No friends, no supporter, no disciple, nobody. Even if you call me, I was not a disciple of his. I was a disciple of someone else. So I was not his follower, but due to shared love, I had 
very much respect for him. So I was the only person standing on the shore to say him goodbye. No one was with me. I could not know that it was such an important thing. Shiva Prabhupada Ki So Hare Krishna. So we might, unless our vehicle, or anyone else wants to add anything? Oh, no, I'm no good for questions this morning. <laughs> but I hope uh, we only went five minutes over. Is that all right, everyone? Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I hope that was, I had other uh, time. Okay, Amika, are you sure? For yeah. 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 That's one little thing. You can take this microphone if you're